the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, good morning. It is a joy to see all of you again today. I pray that you're having a wonderful week. We're celebrating the fast of the Incarnation before the Feast of the Incarnation. It is always a joy to see all of you, as it is a joy to see our families. In our case, it's uh, difficult to get all of our families together with our kids living across the U.S. and in Western Europe. But we had that beautiful opportunity uh, Mother's Day weekend of this year in the spring when we could all come together for the first time, our four children and our three grandchildren. So you can imagine what a great joy that was for us. St. John said it best in his third general epistle when he says that a father has no greater joy than to see that his children walk in the light. And so we had the great privilege and joy and honor that Sunday morning of this weekend to gather together at our son's parish of St. Spiridon's Greek Orthodox Church in Loveland, Colorado. And it was such an amazing honor to be able to look out and see all of our kids and spouses and our, our grandkids and all the, the wonderful, boisterous activity of that young parish. Let me give you a little bit of an idea about what we encountered that day. See, St. Spiridon's is a young church. It's a young convert church, and they had already outgrown the first building that they had purchased to worship in. And so we were in, that morning, the second building that they had worshipped in what we were sort of jokingly referred to as the churchnasium, or as Father Evans said, the Jimma Church. Because, you see, they bought a, a larger complex, but they were completely redoing and rebuilding the sanctuary. And so we were all together there in the 1950s-sized gymnasium, worshiping in very modest circumstances. So the altar table was just two card tables set side by side and covered with vestments. Off on the right were the choir risers that were there kind of tucked in the corner. Along the left wall from the altar was the, the window to the kitchen where we would just sort of move to have coffee hour. And all of the metal folding chairs were right up against the altar because there wasn't enough room in that little building to put all the people who had come to worship. And so as usually happens, my brother, Father Evan asked if I would minister the word that morning and if I would preach. And so I was happy to do so and I began to preach sort of just right here, right next to all these folding chairs and all these people. And I began to, to see their beautiful faces. And I said, you know, when I, when I come here to worship with you, I said, it's very difficult for me. They began to look kind of worried. Well, what do you mean it's difficult to worship with us? I said, yes, it's difficult to worship with you because when I come here and I hear your beautiful voices, when I hear all of you participating, all of you singing, when I hear the beautiful kids and the infants and the toddlers and the children, and when I hear the, the power, the vibrancy, the energy of your worship, it reduces me at the altar almost instantly to tears, which is quite true. When I'm there, I have a, a little Kleenex kind of tucked in my pimanikia. Yeah, I'm the old guy who cries, it's okay. And I say I begin to well up and to tear up because of how beautiful and how powerful and what an amazing validation of orthodox liturgical worship I experience when I'm here with you. And they were at that point just weeks away from moving into the beautiful new sanctuary. And in fact, at the end of a liturgy, I had the joy of going into that construction site and I was handed a big black marker and I was able to sign on the subflooring before the tile went on the altar flooring, by the altar, the name of my family, where I will stand when I go to visit the kids and can celebrate with my brother, but also the name of my home parish, so that we are in that sense sister parishes with St. Spiridon's in Loveland. But I gave these beautiful young people in this beautiful church a caution. I said, I know that you are excited as well you should be to move into your new space, but know this. Once you have done so, you will not be more so the Orthodox Christian community of St. Spiridon's in Loveland, Colorado, than you are right now. And sitting here in our churchnasium, with the card table altar and the choir loft in the corner, 
and the kitchen off to the side, you are not less so the Orthodox Christian parish of St. Spiridon's in Loveland, Colorado, than you will be then. I said, because while churches may have buildings, or not, as the case may be, churches are not only buildings. Right? It's a very basic premise. Churches may have buildings, but churches aren't buildings. Now, if, like me, you've traveled and you've seen other parts of the world, you know this to be true. So, for instance, when Denise and I had the joy of visiting Scotland and we're walking from Edinburgh Castle down the Royal Mile to Holyrood House where the Queen comes every now and again to visit her Scottish cousins. And we put up with that. We Scots, it's okay. We pass a beautiful old church that used to be a church that was being renovated into a nightclub. Great, beautiful old church building, but there was no church there. Living in Denver, there was a, a, a bar, a, a tavern, a restaurant in downtown Denver called The Church. Because it used to be a church. Now it's just a building. To travel through Western Europe, you see many beautiful cathedrals and stately old buildings that have endowments and they have historical preservation funds and the walls are upright and things are well maintained and perfectly in order, but there's no church there. There's just a building. And the memory of what once used to be perhaps a thriving Christian community. Conversely, perhaps like me, you've seen photographs of instances where in Syria, for example, in Aleppo, there was a photograph of three priests standing in the open-air rubble of what used to be a very beautiful church, but now is completely demolished. And yet standing by their broken altar, their hands lifted in adoration of God, offering the divine oblation, there was still a church there, even though there wasn't a building any longer. Because churches may have buildings, but churches aren't just buildings. So what then is a church? What comprises a church? What makes a church to be a church and not just a group of people who get together now and again in a particular building? What do we know from Holy Scripture? The Lord said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So we know that a church is Christ-centered. It is Christocentric. A church, unlike other types of gatherings of people, is one where the primacy of order is given to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is where His name, and not ours, is lifted up. We know from St. Peter in his writings that he tells us that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, some more peculiar than others perhaps, a peculiar people who shone forth the praises of Him who has called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. So we know then that we are also a covenanted people. We're here for a purpose. We don't simply go to a church. There's no spiritual value imputed because your GPS says that you are at 1973 East Maryland. We go to constitute the church. We go to manifest the presence of God. We go to make the church the church because unless we are here, there is no church. Even our church architecture and the words that we use to describe our buildings speaks to us of this very basic and elemental point. When I give tours of churches, whether in Denver or now here or wherever I may be, and begin to talk about the layout of the church, and what all of this represents, represents to us. I talk about the narthex and the nave and the altar. And I always point out that the word nave is from the Greek word, nos. Nos, which depicts the bow of the ship, the prow. So that in Greek, the sailor is called nafti. So naftis is the one who is in the bow of the ship. And of the two types of church architectural themes that we see, the cruciform-shaped church that we're in now, atop of the beautiful dome. There's also the basilica-shaped church, which is intended to look like an upside-down and upturned boat. 
to remind us that the church is first and foremost the ark of our salvation. Just as in the Old Testament, Noah built the ark to save his family, to save humanity, that covenanted people, to save creation from the flood, so too the church, as the indispensable ark of our salvation, exists to carry our souls over the stormy seas of life into the heavenly port. So even the very name that we use to describe this area that we're sitting in here this morning, the nave, Onas, depicts to us the fact that the church is the ark of our salvation. We get that wrong sometimes, and I would say that we can be excused, in a sense, when we do so. Our language betrays us. I'm going to the church. I'm at the church. And so we can begin to think that the church is about location, right? If I'm physically at 1973 East Maryland, I'm somehow in church. We have many buildings in this church that do many very different kinds of things, don't we? And we can begin to think that church is about attending. If we've attended a service, we got like, like in God's like heavenly attendance sheet, you know, check, you made it, good for you. God, right? We think that if we're in the location that somehow we're in church, but not necessarily so. Not necessarily so. This is very important when it comes to understanding, we talk about supporting the church, what it is that we are supporting. The Paris Council had a very busy summer. We were trying to find a way to stretch a bed sheet over a much larger mattress, not quite hitting all four corners as our revenue kind of dried up. And the needs and the demands of this 10-acre, $11 million campus again outstripped our available revenues at a time when our revenues were actually quite robust through the summer. We find time and again that our, our meetings, our deliberations, our considerations are dominated by concerns for bricks and mortar. Bricks and mortar don't make a church. We need greater endowments, Father. There are a lot of beautiful buildings that are endowed across this country. There are virtually no thriving church, Eucharistic communities in the United States of America today that are endowed. Buildings can be endowed. Parishes cannot. So when we talk about supporting the church, we talk about supporting the ministry of the church, we must not be talking about bricks and mortar. Because, beloved, I am no more enthused about supporting bricks and mortar than you are. As I said in the bulletin today, if the aim of our resources is to pay the light bill, we will probably raise enough money to pay the light bill. But if that isn't the church, then what is? Beloved, the church is you and me and these beautiful altar boys here and the choir and our Sunday school classes and our dance ministry and it's our desert diamonds. It's joy and hope and Goya. It's Bible studies. Above all, it's divine worship. When we talk about supporting the church, God forbid that we only speak about supporting a building. Buildings come and buildings go. Beloved, whether we have all these buildings or some of these buildings or none of these buildings, by God's grace, if we choose to be so, we will no less be the Eucharistic community of Holy Trinity Cathedral in Phoenix, Arizona, because it is predicated not on bricks and mortar, not on etched glass, not on marble, but on souls. The church is first and last a repository for the salvation of souls. We speak of stewardship as being time. Our time. Show me a man's schedule. Show me a man's day planner. We don't have us anymore, do we? No, I guess on his phone. His Google Calendar. And I'll show you what's important to him. We talk about time. 
If we understand the church to be about souls, about ministry, about salvation, about facilitating salvation, then this will become in our minds, our hearts, will grow the understanding that this is a worthy enterprise that is worth the investment of my time. We talk about talents. Each of us, when we're baptized and chrismated and brought into the church, are graced by God, graced by the Holy Spirit with certain talents, with certain abilities. Not mundane abilities that can make you money in the workplace, but spiritual ones. And so once we begin to understand that the church is about souls, about ministry, about salvation, then we'll want to be here, we'll want to participate, and we will want to add our talents to the whole. And only when those two conditions are met does it become even appropriate to speak about your treasure. Because our understanding of the church is limited so much of the time to think only of bricks and mortar, we think of stewardship as being only about the treasure that we can have to keep the walls standing upright. That is not stewardship because that is not the true meaning of the church. Beloved, churches may or may not have buildings. But every church that is truly a church has people, has souls, has those who are striving for salvation, who want to see and to know God, who want to be changed by God. And this is where that takes place. Their ancient sort of maxims and sayings in the church to talk about how indispensable the church is to our salvation. There's one that says where you find one Christian alone, you find no Christian. There's another one that says that we go to heaven all together, but we go to hell alone. We are a community of souls. Our salvation depends on being in relationship with one another as we are in relationship with God. Those who think they can be an Orthodox Christian apart from themselves, never attending the services, are sadly and dangerously mistaken. Because to be an Orthodox Christian is to be a part of this Eucharistic community, to belong to one another, to work out our salvation in the messiness of relationships, in the big, beautiful, boisterous family that we are here, with all the sort of irritants that we sometimes create for each other, nonetheless, not just despite that, but because of that, the power of God is revealed in our midst. This is Stewardship Sunday. Before I could have any right to talk to you about what number you're going to put on your stewardship commitment card this morning and between now and the end of the year, I must speak to you about the nature of the church. If we begin to understand what the nature of the church is really about and what it is not about, then it becomes less and less necessary to have a kind of conversation with you about your material support of it. That is the stewardship message we need to hear. Beloved, our future is in our hands. A community like this one that can rise to the challenges we face on the Saturday of festival and in many other instances where we come together, we all put our hands to the wheel, so to speak, and we move the ball forward. As I said last week in the Paris Assembly, we cannot legitimately say of ourselves we can't. We can say we choose not to, like a petulant child, I don't want to. We can say that, but we can't really say we can't do much of anything around here. So let us then get a vision of what the church is and the essential reality of the church in our lives for salvation. And once we come to understand that, I believe our revenue challenges will take care of themselves.